So, um, this is me trying a live stream. I did this a couple of years ago uh, during COVID and where I was, I was staying at my mother's house at the time and the internet wasn't very good, so the, the stream quality wasn't great. The problem is, I, I'm going to have tonight, is I can't see the comments. Uh, so you could be saying, this doesn't work, I can't hear you. But I can't hear you, so we're just going to have to um, go with that, I think. All right. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to read from my book, Further Ghost Stories, which is available, in case anybody's interested. And I'm going to do a short story... Uh, because this is really a, a test affair. So this is going to be called um, A Trip to the Morgue. Suitably grim. And it's a short, a short little story. And this is just to, just to see if there are any technical problems. I hope there aren't. But um, yeah, there may be. So this is a chance to iron them out. Or to learn about them anyway. So this is a trip to the morgue from my book, Further Ghost Stories. <clears throat> I never minded working nights. We worked one on, so you were alone in the porter cabin unit on the north side of the hospital. When the crisis team was first started, we used to go out to people's houses if they called us in the night. But then they cut our staff so there was only one of us on and it was too dangerous to go out in the dark to unknown places with unpredictable people. Instead we got the patients to come and see us and we'd see them in accident and emergency or uh, the only other place we went was the police custody cells. It was safer than going out, mainly safe of course. I've been attacked by patients in both police custody and in the clinic room we used and in a cell once I had to get rescued by burly coppers who pulled the guy off and in A&E by a thin, posh doctor who I thought would be soft but who turned out to be a martial artist and saved my bacon. But I got quick at running out through the cubicle swing doors when I first saw the rage beginning to build. We used to use the kids' room in A&E at first but then they built us a custom-built unit complete with doors on both sides so we couldn't get blocked in by patients. On nights, it was rare I saw someone who wasn't either drunk or drugged, but I digress. It was the Christmas period. It's always Christmas in my memory of that job, but it must have been summer sometimes, or autumn, but that particular night, it definitely was around Christmas. I should say that the hospital was a 1960s build. I think it had been opened by Princess Margaret in 1960, in fact. It was shabby and has since been refurbished. It's not the new hospital I'm talking about. This all happened in the old hospital. I don't mind doing nights, like I said. A crisis team is a demanding, a demand-led service. Some nights were crazy, excuse the pun, and you could be doing assessments one after the other all night and writing them up until the morning shift came in. Quieter nights were better. There, were always plenty, there was always plenty of paperwork to catch up on, go through the files to make sure all the actions had been done, do the shift planner for the next day, check the medication cupboards, plenty. Often, when you came on shift, there'd be one waiting for you down in A&E. The easiest ones had been brought in by friends or family and were desperate and wanted help. That's straightforward. Even the psychotic ones were straightforward. I don't mean in terms of suffering. I mean in terms of procedure. We just arranged for them to be admitted to the psych ward. The tricky ones were some of the people with personality disorders. Not all of them, many were just sad and despairing. The most difficult for us were the ones who were sad and despairing and also hated everyone and everything and were raging at the world and that included us. Sometimes they'd find our porter cabin after we'd left them and come and smash the windows or daub insults on the door. It scared some of the staff being alone there at night, wondering who was waiting for them when they opened the outer door to go home. So that night, a bloke who'd had too much cocaine, a woman who said a GP wouldn't give her the right antidepressants, a youth who thought he had ADHD and ASD and CPTSD because he was following someone on TikTok who had them. And now I've been called back to A&E to see a young lass brought in by a mother who was being bullied at school and who'd self-harmed. 
We had an airlock type affair from our porter cabin into the main hospital corridor. I swear it was like being in a space station. You certainly felt removed from the normal world. The wards up at our end were closed then, scheduled for demolition, and they've gone now, as has our porter cabin. You went through the porter cabin, then down a long corridor with locked doors to wards scheduled for demolition, three on the left, two on the right. The lights here were dim because the way wasn't much used, apart from us coming from the porter cabin. Then you got to a crossroads with stairs going up or down that was marginally busier and had better light. Kids ward was to the left, the young disabled unit right, so there were people in there and nurses doing errands every now and again. You then walked along another corridor that led to the management offices, which were all in darkness overnight, of course. I remember that night they'd left their Christmas tree on, twinkling in the gloom. That cheered me up. There was also a shortcut. It saved only about three or four minutes, but it was still a shortcut. You went down a narrow concrete spiral staircase. I guess it was a maintenance route and not everyone knew about it, but I prided myself on my intimate knowledge of all routes within the hospital. You could go up to the top floors and ultimately the bell tower. Yes, it had a concrete, brutalist bell tower. You could go down to the subterranean levels, to the morgue. Down there was the shortcut. It was spooky, but also mysterious, but I was more scared of the living than the dead. The corridor that led between the morgue and the main hospital was full of old beds and commodes and metal crutches, all stacked up, and things kept just in case they were needed. At one end was the service lift. The porters would wheel the newly deceased under their tarpaulins on gurneys from the lift to the morgue, out of sight. So that night, I thought I'd take the shortcut. I descended the concrete spiral with a pitter-patter of my shoes until I got to the wide gurney roadway. It had some lighting, but not enough to see well in. Nobody was really supposed to be down there at this time of night. I think it was about 11pm. I strolled my way to the lift, hit the button, and the wide double-door elevator came down with a groaning of aged machinery. The hiss doors slid slowly open. I stepped in, punched the button, and up I rose to floor one. This was a brighter area. Here you had A&E with the ambulances arriving, but also a cafe that was open and was quite busy during visiting hours. At this time of night, the visitors had mainly gone, but some of the patients who were waiting for discharge would come here because they were bored and they came down in their nightgowns and smocks and sometimes dragging a drip with them. Lots of them smoked outside A&E doors, though it was frowned on and officially banned. The saddest sight I ever saw was smokers outside the hospital door. That was the editors who sang that. Like I said, I had to see this young girl who was 14 or 15, I forget, She'd self-harmed. That's a pretty sad sight too. The A&E nurse cleaned up the superficial wound. It didn't need sutures or glue or steri strips. The girl had cut herself with a pencil sharpener blade. That was very common. I did the assessment. That helped them both feel better, I hope. I mainly just listened. I couldn't do anything about the bullying at school, but said the right thing, advised her to go and see her GP. I was never sure why we said that, or what the GP could do about bullying, but we always said it, and then they left. I went round to A&E Miners because Haley was on, and I quite liked Haley. She seemed pleased to see me, and we did some mild flirting. I think I saw the sister roll her eyes, but we persisted, talking about not much until the phone rang to say they had an incoming code red. It was an old guy with chest pain. I saw them rush in with him, paramedics handing over to the A&E nurses. He looked grim, ashen-faced, sweaty-browed, grey hair plastered over his forehead. He had an oxygen mask on, barely conscious. The sister turned and said to me, Don't you have work to do? Have you got any more for me here? Me? They always said that. Haley sighed and I said, Haley sighed and said, Later, Graham, I need to go into recess. I went and got a coffee and saw Haley return. Her eyes were moist. We lost him, she said. Sorry to hear that. But the sister was there too. Honestly, Graham, even if you don't have work to do, my staff do, so shoo. By then, 
I gave a little hand flap, walked back to the lift. I should say that like most hospitals, all the patients wear wristbands for identification, and the few wandering around here had their green bands with their names and hospital numbers. If they died, they took the green band off and put a plain red one on, and then they got wheeled down to the underground road to the morgue. I don't know why they had to designate them officially dead, but they did. Anyway, I got to the lift. Once I got back to the porter cabin, it would take me an hour plus to do the paperwork for the assessment I'd completed. We had to do letters to GP, risk assessments, then add all the coding on our own computer systems so that our managers could track workflow, etc., ad, ad infinitum, ad absurdum. I still had half a cup of coffee left when I got to the lift. It was later. Most people had disappeared. But there was one woman patient hanging round by the lift door. I took very little notice of her, to be honest. I remember she was dressed in a hospital gown and had neck-length dark hair, but I didn't really look at her. The lift door opened and I stepped in, and she stepped in after me. I said, Floor? But she didn't speak, so I shrugged, hit the U button for the under-hospital level. She could press the button to get back to her ward herself. It was just before 1am at this time. The lift rumbled down and settled. There was that minute or so before the doors opened, when I always imagine they're stuck and I'll have to hit the emergency button. But they opened. I stepped out into the gloomy undercroft of the hospital, the morgue road stretching away into the dark, tiny lights in a row on the top right showing the way. About three of the bulbs were out. I guess down here wasn't a maintenance priority. The rows of waiting beds on either side of the passageway were shadowy and ominous looking. The woman got out with me. I said, sorry, uh, this isn't really a patient area. The wards are up on the higher floors. Uh, just get back into the lift and press button two or, or whichever floor you're on. Uh, uh, which ward are you on? I said, trying to be helpful. She didn't speak. I really didn't need this down here. I said, honestly, you can't be down here. And then I heard it. It was a groan that came from down the barely lit corridor ahead. Groan. Then shuffling. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. I'm not a superstitious person and I don't believe in ghosts and ghoulies, but this was down on the morgue level at one o'clock in the morning, and the lights didn't work properly. I stepped back towards the lift. The doors, had, the doors had closed, so I jabbed the call button. The lift was still there, so the doors wheezed open and revealed the metal box with its bright neon tube light. I didn't want to be a complete wuss, so I waited at the open door for the woman to step back into the lift. Ahead came an awful noise, like gas escaping from a cadaver, and I peered and saw a shape looming out of the dark. It came on two legs, lurching forward. As it stepped closer, about ten yards, I recognised him. It was the man from Resus, the guy who had the chest pain. I frowned. What was he doing down here? He should have been admitted. Then I remembered Haley's tears. No point admitting him. And in the inadequate light of that passage, I saw he had a band round his left wrist. I stepped back into the lift. Hit the button! I yelled to the woman who stood there, motionless and dumb. The man staggered closer. Hit the button, for God's sake, I screamed. She spoke for the first time. Shouldn't we wait for that man? I stammered. No, no, don't you see the colour of his wristband? It's red. And then she lifted her own wrist and said, What? Like this one. <clears throat> so they are a short story there hopefully it worked i need to go and check the technicalities now but i hope you enjoyed that i'm going to disappear from live now um, and um, if this worked i'll come and do some more i'm hoping to do a big one for halloween but uh, there we are okay all right
Bye bye, everyone. Uh, yeah, you can get. But I shouldn't end with a plug. You you can get further ghost stories if you're in the UK from my Etsy shop. It's better for me, but the cost of shipping it abroad are too much. So if if you want further ghost stories by Tony Walker, go to your local bookstore and just order it, and you'll be able to get it uh, through distribution there. But if you want it from me and you're in the UK, I'll I'll sign one and send it to you. Okay. All right. Good night. <coughs>